I'm Jared Ledbetter, and I'm at the California Institute of Technology. And for some 24 years now, my research has sought to clarify the relationship between termites and their hindgut microbes. Now, in particular interest uh, to me is the metabolism of hydrogen that is generated during this fermentation of wood. But today, I want to give you a broad overview on microbial diversity and on some of the essentials of termite hindgut microbiology. So I want to talk about biological diversity in general, because many who are interested in biology are missing, actually, some of the uh, full diversity that we see in the microbial world. And then I also want to comment about how some of this diversity is surprisingly abundant in certain areas of the world, and that we must understand what that diversity does and how it functions. So this will bring me to termites and the symbiosis they form with their hindgut microbes. And I want to introduce you to several major groups of termite hindgut microbes. The cellulose decomposing protozoa, methane producing archaea, and a group of abundant and unusual bacteria called spirochetes. I'm going to then touch on how we can study different termites and learn about different events that may have occurred during the symbiosis in the past, and then I'll give you some conclusions. I wonder how many people who are watching this have grown up thinking about Three Kingdoms. Up until the 1960s, I think most people grew up thinking that there were animals, plants, and fungi, and that maybe, depending on their education, even up through current years, uh, most enthusiasts of biology understood there to be between three and five kingdoms. Maybe you had the bacteria as a fourth, and the protists as a fifth. But starting in the 1960s, we had a revolution in the study of the relationships between different organisms, and started to realize that many things that we were seeing and also not seeing are very, very different from these three major groups. So for example, if you look at a key gene that is present in all known organisms, you can make comparisons between this gene, and from that infer how those organisms are related to each other. The thing I want to point out on this slide is that you have the fungi and the animals and the plants. And those are just three twigs on a branch that has many other twigs. Really, if those three twigs and the length of those lines denote evolu evolutionary relationships, then there are more than three kingdoms. There are easily a half dozen. The other thing I want to point out here is that if you think about plant metabolism, there are some organisms on this tree which also carry out photosynthesis, let's say the kelp or the red seaweed. But those branches are actually very different from the plants. They are as distantly related to plants as you and I are from plants. And I think that's very important. Also, when we talk about single-celled eukaryotes, like protozoa, realize, oh, paramecium and the protozoan babesia are actually two very different organisms. Again, as distantly related to each other as we are from, let's say, the yeast that you used to make beer and uh, uh, bread. So the number of kingdoms or major divisions of life already gets more complex than those three that we know. The truth is actually much more complex than that, because this is now just a snippet of a branch of a much more complex tree. You'll see that I've just blown up this section of a much larger tree. One of the things I want to point out on this slide is that there are many, many branches on this, easily a hundred, which are uh, more distant from each other than the distance between corn and animals. And what that suggests then is that uh, we have a lot to learn about the differences between these different groups. So for instance, everything that is lying outside of the circle is a microbe. So there's single-celled organisms which are smaller than you can see with your naked eye. So for as much as we can appreciate biological diversity that you can see, 
The true diversity of life is beyond the resolution of the human eye, and we have to use other methods to really understand how it works. The second thing I want to point out is how different the way of living is for corn or plant and ourselves, or from a yeast that used to make bread and beer. If the length of those lines, which is comparatively short, and the difference in, uh, differences of these organisms is so great, imagine the possible differences in the ways that these organisms live. So we are potentially really missing out not just on diversity in terms of how things are related, but also missing out on the diversity of what organisms are actually doing in the environment. And so if we're to understand the environment, we really have to learn more about what these other organisms are doing. Let's come back to this tree. Let's come back to this organism kelp. I want to illustrate another point. It's not just that there are many, many organisms out there which are different from the organisms we're most familiar with, but in some environments, those organisms are present and very, very abundant. Take the kelp. You can find kelp forests off the coast of California. And those kelp are performing what we might call plant metabolism. So they are the primary producers in those environments. But keep in mind, they're not plants. So the story of these coastal ecosystems is in large part driven by an organism that's very different from a plant. And so if we want to understand those coastal ecosystems, part of the story is understanding the biology of kelp and understanding in what ways they are similar and different to the terrestrial or land plants that we study. Now, I want to shift from the oceans to my own research, which is study on termites and their hindgut microbes. And I want to point out that the termite hindgut is an environment. It happens to be an environment that lives in a small insect, but we can compare and contrast that environment with, for, for instance, a very rich marine environment like the Sargasso Sea. There are certain reasons why you might want to study a small environment like in a termite. Sargasso Sea is a wonderful and amazing place, very important to study, but it's a thousand kilometers across, and there's only one of them. The termite hindgut is only about one cubic millimeter in volume, and yet it contains hundreds and hundreds of microbes that you find nowhere else in nature. Just if you were to take the top millimeter of the Sargasso Sea, the volume of that across those thousands of kilometers is 19 orders of magnitude greater than the volume of that one termite. So we can actually bring a termite into laboratory and be able to study an entire environment. The hindgut, it's tiny yet complex, many hundreds of species, and some of those species are yet unstudied. So it is still bewilderingly complex, and it's well bounded. We know that the gut lining and the outside of the termite are where you might define the boundaries of that system. Sargasso Sea is wonderful, but there's only one of them, and its boundaries are a little bit user-defined. We think that it's, you know, the currents that are intersecting here and there are what bound that region, whereas in the insect, it's very well bounded. And of course, the termite is available in large numbers of replicates. So we can, in the laboratory, have that one environment that's tiny and well bounded replicated in termite after termite and termite. So we can start to do some comparative studies and perturbation studies, which are just not possible with a large environment like the Sargasso Sea, for which there's only one. So I study a very particular termite that we find in Ponderosa pine that's fallen in the Angeles National Forest of Southern California. And here is one of these Ponderosa pines and uh, two of my former students who have peeled off some of the bark from this log, which has been on the ground for probably five or ten years. And if you look a little bit more closely, you can see that just on the underside of that bark are a number of termites of different what we call morphological casts. These ones with the dark mandibles are actually soldiers. Rather than eating wood, they have big mandibles that they can use to attack, for instance, another termite or an invading ant. So this is the termite that we study for the most part in my laboratory. It's the dampwood termite. Zootromopsis nevidensis, and it's about a centimeter in length. It's one of the larger termites that you'll find on Earth. Now, this is what we call a worker, and from another specimen, I've extracted the hindgut tract 
and that is shown here. And what you'll observe is that there is a long tubular region which is somewhat analogous to our small intestine. And then you have this uh, hindgut paunch which is somewhat analogous to our large intestine. And it's in this paunch that really you find a lot of things that excite microbiologists. You find a density of microbes that you find nowhere else in nature. And they represent all three domains of life. Earlier on that slide, I'd shown you that tree of life where you actually have three major subgroups. Uh, and those are the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryotes. You find single-celled relatives of all three of those groups uh, comprising hundreds of species in this hindgut paunch. So before I tell you more about termite gut microbes, I want to tell you a little bit more about termites. There are about 3,000 species of termite on Earth. Termites are related to cockroaches and to the mantids, like the praying mantis. And they're actually, although insects, quite distantly related to ants, wasps, and bees, which are also social. So this is an example of where society or sociality in insects has arisen in two different groups of insects which are very different from each other. So termites and those 3,000 species of them can be subgrouped into several different families. And their closest relative in the insect world is the, what we call the wood roach, which is a non-social but wood-feeding insect that you find in the Carolinas, in the Pacific Northwest, and in parts of China. And many of the microbiology and the, the features of the microbiology in the wood roach are actually shared with the uh, termites. And so it's thought that many of the uh, microbial processes that arose arose in the last common ancestor of this roach and termites. Now the termite that I study, Zootermopsis, belongs to this one group in the Termopsidae. So over time, we can start to ask, are any of the patterns that we see here uh, present in some of these other groups? Now if you extract the gut from Zootermopsis, or another termite, and you take a cross-section through that gut, what you'll see is that the insect tissue itself is actually very, very thin. It's only about 10 microns in diameter, so 1% of a millimeter in thickness. The bulk volume of that is comprised by the gut contents. And what you see here, these larger objects, are single-celled eukaryotes called protozoa. Now historically, until the mid-1990s, this region, this environment, was thought to be completely anoxic so devoid of oxygen. Many of the microbes that you find in the core regions of this gut are poisoned by oxygen. Really. Here you have this insect which is living in the aerobic world and wandering around on its six, le six legs in a, um, in a piece of wood or on a piece of wood containing microbes which are poisoned by oxygen. The story is actually even more complex because it turns out uh, through studies that were performed by Andreas Bruna and John Bresnak in the mid-1990s, the oxygen actually diffuses across the insect gut wall and then is consumed by biological processes in the periphery of that hindgut. And it's those biological processes in the periphery which lead to the lack of oxygen in the core which protects some of those oxygen-sensitive microorganisms. So not only do you find organisms which are uh, unique to the termite gut habitat that you find nowhere else on Earth, but many of these are poisoned by oxygen and are very sensitive to desiccation. So their life outside of the termite is very, very limited. So what you have are microbes that are very dependent on their host, and because of their processes, which allow the host to derive nutrition from wood, makes the host very dependent on their microbes. And when a termite emerges from its egg, it doesn't have these microbes in its gut. It's fed those microbes by other of its littermates or by its parents. And if those microbes don't take hold, that termite will fail. And if that termite fails, those microbes will also fail. So when we look at one termite that's walking around on a piece of wood today, we are looking at over 100 million years 
of having this microbial community passed from one termite to the next termite to the next termite, generation to generation to generation. It's quite a remarkable story of a journey that's been taken between many, many organisms together. So if we go and look at a little bit of a higher magnification of what's inside the gut, uh, this is what we call a DIC uh, image uh, using a, a microscope of some of the larger protozoal cells. These are about 60 microns in length. So roughly 20 of these laid end to end to end would be a millimeter in length. And some of these are the primary agents of wood degradation in this termite. You also see some smaller cells, which are also protozoa. So these are single-celled eukaryotes, of which there are about a dozen in this one termite that you find uh, nowhere else in nature, and their closest relatives are in other termites. There are some interesting associations that you find between these protozoa and certain bacteria. For instance, if you look at the surface of one of these, at higher magnification, you'll see that those protozoa are covered with long lines of grooves. And in those grooves, you see these little black objects. Those are bacteria. So the surface of that single cell of eukaryote is arrayed with a very regular group of a very specific bacterium. And without knowing much more about it, the notion you might have is that there is something that that protozoan is getting from that bacterium and vice versa. So there are associations between the microbes that live in the gut and there are associations with those microbes in their host. So there are many levels of biological interaction which are occurring in this environment. Another example of a protozoan that has a bacterial association is this organism, which is called Streblomastic strix. The eukaryote, the single-celled protozoan, is actually very, very slender and running through the center of this. That protozoan is covered with a blanket or a coat of long, thin bacterial cells that are creating those ridges that you see. We know very little about the interaction between this protozoan and those bacteria and what they're doing for each other, but clearly it's a very specific an interesting interaction. So there are many cases of protozoa and their bacteria that occur in these environments, which we have much more to learn in the future. Now, uh, there's an opening line to a book by the biophysicist Howard Berg. Uh, his book is called Random Walks in Biology. And the opening lines are that biology is wet and dynamic. What does that mean? I've just showed you these still pictures, but I think that the still pictures don't do this environment justice. Really, when you're looking at this environment live, this is now some of that gut fluid which has been diluted. It's even more densely packed than this inside the termite. But if you dilute that fluid and put it on a microscope slide, you see some of these protozoa and coursing on amongst them lots of smaller bacteria which are moving so quickly you can barely focus on them. I can just look at this for forever, and you can look at it using different types of microscopy to show different details on some of these cells. The point here is that when I go to work every morning, I go to work in what I call a miniature Alice in Wonderland. That it is, just from a naturalist standpoint, a very wonderful and diverse place that begs lots of questions. So what is the interaction that termites have with their gut microbes? I want to give you an overview of some of the major things that we've learned over about the last 100 years uh, on the association between the insect and its gut microbes. Now microbes have a huge challenge in life. The challenge is, how do you eat something larger than your head? If you are the size of uh, one thousandth of a millimeter, how do you gain access to nutrients in a two by four or in a big log? So you have a really wonderful association with an insect that has jaws and grinding mandibles, which are very, very hard. They can then take a large block of wood and grind it into really small particles and then bring them into the gut in a very controlled and wonderful environment in which these microbes can thrive. Now in the hindgut, these protozoa that I showed you have enzymes of their own 
and enzymes that they recruit from the insect to start breaking down the polysaccharides in wood. The cellulose and another component which we call uh, xylan or the hemicellulose. And these protozoa perform a very unusual fermentation. It's a fermentation that differs from the one that you use to make sauerkraut or that you use to make beer and wine. What those protozoa do is they break down the hexoses in cellulose, primarily to acetate, so neutralize vinegar. And that acetate builds up in the hindgut of the termite and is absorbed by the insect. So the insect is actually absorbing the acetate and using it as its biofuel. It is the source of carbon for the insect and the source of energy for the insect. Now, those protozoa also produce hydrogen gas. So think the 1930s, this classic picture of the Hindenburg blimp over New Jersey blowing up in fire. It was filled with hydrogen. There is a lot of energy in hydrogen. It's not just combustible, it's an energy source that can be used by different microorganisms. So in the termite, and in many environments which are non-marine and devoid of oxygen, hydrogen CO2 is converted into methane by a group of organisms called methanogenic archaea, and this methane is emitted by the insect. It is sort of lost calories. So as we know, we can burn methane, we use it as a fuel, and that methane which is emitted by the insect then is a fuel, potential energy source, which is lost from the system. So we can use a form of microscopy to observe these methanogenic archaea in the termite. Several years ago, I was trying to find out where are those archaea present in the system. And what I learned is that they are uh, colonize the gut wall of many, inside the gut wall of many termites. So if you dissect out the gut, you cut open the gut, you wash away all the contents, and you sort of open that up and look at the internal surface of it, you can look for a type of uh, fluorescence called F420 fluorescence. These organisms that make methane contain a vitamin, and when you shine UV light on that vitamin, the vitamin turns blue. And so with a proper microscope, you can start to see a number of different cell types which are blue that live on the inside of this gut wall. And in this image you see there are three different morphologies of organisms. Now I'm somebody who likes food, so I like to say that this one long one looks like long blue spaghetti, the curved rods look like basmati rice, and some of these straight rods look like regular rice. Now termites emit up to 4% of global methane every year. So by studying these organisms in their environment and also culturing them and bringing them to the lab, we can put a face on the process at a single microbial cell level for actually a very significant source of global methane. Not the most significant source of global methane, methane but a small but significant source. I uh, like to show this slide of a paper mache cow I knew that when I first got to Caltech, I was having some impact on undergraduate life uh, there because when I talked about termites and processes that occur in a cow, the next Caltech ditch day it occurs every spring. Uh, the students had made this large paper mache cow and filled it with chocolate pudding, Easter grass, oatmeal, and Easter eggs that were filled with clues on where the students should go to their next uh, puzzle. Uh, and you can see here the students trying to find those eggs. The point I want to make here is that uh, cows lose about 20% of their electrons in their food as methane. It's a huge waste of energy. And although termites contain methanogens and emit methane, it's only a very small amount of this hydrogen CO2 that is lost to the system as methane. On a global scale, it's significant. But actually, on a global scale, the methane emission by termites would be much more significant if this hydrogen CO2 was not being consumed by a dif different group of organisms, which we call uh, CO2-reducing homocytogens. So many termites contain microbes that completely push these methane organisms out of the picture, or push 90% of them out of the picture. So many termites will take, have microbes that convert hydrogen, CO2, into acetate. And this acetate then goes into that pool in the gut and is absorbed by the insect. So up to a third to a fifth 
of the acetate which is used as the biofuel by these insects is derived from carbon dioxide and hydrogen by way of the activity of those protozoa and by way of the activity of these organisms here. So I've long been interested in the interaction between organisms competing for this hydrogen CO2 that make acetate and that make uh, methane from those. Understand how they compete with each other. How has this process come to pass in termites? Why doesn't it occur in the cow rumen? And how do these hydrogen consumers interact with the organisms which are producing the hydrogen, the protozoa? So CO2 reductive acetogenesis is a bacterial activity. Uh, the process involves the fixation of two molecules of carbon dioxide, one, two, with four molecules of hydrogen. One, two, three, four. And in the process, those two carbons are joined and reduced to form the acetate. And this metabolism is actually yields energy for the bacteria which are performing it, in addition to yielding the acetate which can be used by the insect. So it's a mutually beneficial uh, metabolism that takes hydrogen produced during this fermentation, turns it into additional fuel for the insect, meanwhile supporting the activity of the bacteria that perform it. Uh, but for years we did not have a very good understanding about what bacteria in the termite are actually catalyzing this process. We had some ideas, but over the years we've been trying to learn more. Now if you look in the hindguts of termites, you'll even see on some of these protozoa that there are very abundant spiral shaped organisms which can be attached to the protozoa and that can also be seen uh, uh, living and swimming amongst the protozoa. And in most termites, these organisms which we call spirochetes are some of the more abundant bacteria that you'll see swimming in and amongst these protozoa. If you go to another portion of the gut, maybe you'll see that there are even more of these spiral shaped organisms. So starting in the 1990s, scientists in, at Michigan State and in Germany discovered that these spirochetes are actually very closely related to Treponema pallidum. That's one of the most famous organisms in microbiology. It's what causes syphilis. Actually, all these bacteria in the termite are species that belong to the same genus as the agent of syphilis. And yet you always find these organisms present in happy and healthy termites. But we didn't know what they did because like syphilis, they had never been cultured in vitro. First observed in the 1860s, over a century went by before we had actually learned about what any of these do. And I would still argue that we are still in our infancy of understanding what the full breadth of the different roles of the hundred or more species of spirochete that you can see in an individual termite hindgut. But a number of years ago, I really endeavored for a very long period of time to try to coax one or two of these species into laboratory culture so that we could ask what they do. And I had an idea. Maybe some of these are these acetogens that can take hydrogen and CO2 and make acetate. The problem with that is that activity was not known to occur in any spirochete and none of these spirochetes from the termite have been cultured. So it's an idea, but what you really need to do is get one of these into the laboratory and ask it, are you capable of doing that? And if not, what do you do? So, what is a spirochete? This is a political cartoon from the early 70s and will sort of shoot right over the heads of almost all of us, but I still include it because a little bit of uh, American history that Richard Nixon's first vice president, Spiro T. Agnew, uh, sort of had to leave office for some uh, misdealings that he had, and this was before even the Watergate scandal blew up. So when I say spirochete, I'm not talking about a spiro cheat, but a different organism. And these are bacteria that have a very unusual body plan. So many bacteria can swim, and they have flagella that extend into the extracellular milieu and act like propellers. But spirochetes have flagella that extend not out of the cell, but in out past the first membrane but lie in between the inner and the outer membrane of the bacterial cell and actually will wrap 
around the cell. Okay. If you look at a cross section, you can see what I mean. These are the flagella that lie in between the inner and the outer membrane. And when those flagella turn, the entire cell becomes the propeller as opposed to being attached to the propeller. And spirochetes are known to be able to move into very thick, viscous environments and are sort of the world's record holder in the microbial world for being able to wiggle into really thick and tight places. And all the organisms that have this body plan are also related to each other. So it's both a related group by genetics and by their body plan. So these are microscopic images of the first termite gut spirochete that was isolated. We call this organism Treponema permitia. And the first thing we want to ask was whether it was really a spirochete. And what I want to point out here is that if you look at it with a whole cell negative stain by transmission electron microscopy or a thin section, it has these hallmark uh, flagella that are uh, lying in between the inner and the outer membrane. Now, the second thing we learned about Treponema permitia is that it is actually a hydrogen plus CO2 acetogen. Hydrogen stimulated its growth, and it consumed hydrogen and made acetate and expected four hydrogen to one acetate stoichiometry. You could also grow this organism under radioactive carbon dioxide. And when you do that, it generates radioactive acetate. So it's fixing CO2 into organic carbon. And when you ask, are both carbon positions of acetate labeled? They were. And lastly, there are enzymes associated with this pathway, and this organism exhibited them all. So it is a bona fide hydrogen CO2 acetogen. And although a close relative of the organism that causes syphilis, this organism actually plays a key role in the fermentation of wood in the termite and in taking some nutritional value of that wood and passing it back on to the termite. Now, we have been studying this organism for almost 20 years now. And one of the things we've done is really looked at its genes for this pathway and used our study of these genes in red to do comparative studies in other termites and also in this particular termite ask, can we learn if this is the only acetogen or if there are other species and who are those other species? So we can take an approach now where we can take a look at the diversity of these genes for this pathway in this one termite, but also in members of these two other major subgroups of the termite line of descent, and also in the wood roach. And so we've been learning a lot about the diversity of organisms that can carry out that metabolism in a diversity of different uh, species and actually major subgroupings of insects that eat wood. Now, we've also been able to isolate a second spirochete from Zoetermopsis. This one we call Treponema azotonutritium. Now this organism plays a very different role in the symbiosis with the termite and its high gut microbes. So if you think about it, wood is not only tough to eat, it's not a very good source of protein. You know, at best, it's like a potato, right? It's got a lot of polysaccharide, a lot of carbs, but not a lot of nitrogen. So you can be degrading that wood and providing the calories to the host, but that's only one of the host's major problems in life. The other, pro other problem is to make protein. And so if you ask what's going to limit the ability of this insect that's eating a block of wood or your home, what's going to limit its proliferation, part of the story is on protein. So it turns out that some 35 years ago, John Bresnak, uh, at Michigan State University discovered that termites contain microbes that can take atmospheric nitrogen, which is bathing all of us, and is in the atmosphere all around us, and can take that and turn it into protein that can then be fed to the insect. And this particular spirochete, we, when we got it into culture, into laboratory, we could show can do that same activity. So this is one of the organisms that we say can exhibit diazotrophic growth. It can grow as with N2 gas as its sole source of eventual protein. And it shows very several activities which you associate with that activity and therefore is playing a role in taking a very abundant but unusable source of nitrogen around the insect and actually feeding the insect 
uh, protein level nitrogen. I'll mention too that this particular organism is unlike the first. It's not an organism that can consume hydrogen and fix CO2 into acetate. It actually degrades sugars and produces hydrogen that it can feed to the other spirochete. So it plays different roles in the symbiosis. So I've talked to you about some protozoa, about some methanogenic archaea, and about just some of the many, many bacteria that you can find in a termite. Uh, there are many other stories I can tell you, but I want to leave off with my talk by just pointing out that we've talked about these three major groups in, the, in this environment. That environment is dominated by members of diverse groups which are very different from the host itself. So just like the kelp forests, these are environments which are dominated by genetic groups and groups performing physiologies which are very different from sort of the paradigms of biology and that we learn a lot by studying them. So I think with that, I'll close this introductory talk on termite gut microbiology. There are many, many general aspects that we could discuss and of course can go into many other aspects in great detail. And so I like to point out that there have been many research groups and scientists that have been working on termites for well over a century. And I've tried to encapsulate some of their findings as well as the findings of my own laboratory into the presentation that I've given you today. Thank you very much.